Hi everyone, and um, welcome to this month's edition of Be Live. Um, so this month we're celebrating LGBT Plus History Month, and if I can give you a bit of information about what that's about, so it's a month-long um, annual celebration of les lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans um, history, um, and it happens every February. Um, and it was started in 2005 and um, this year's theme is um, body, mind and spirit. And yeah, so I'll give an opportunity for my lovely guests to introduce themselves. So we're joined by Phil Samba and the Reverend Jade McCauley. So Phil, can you just tell us a bit about yourself, please? Sure. Um, so um, I'm the strategic lead for Prep for Women of Colour at Prepster within um, a big organisation called The Love Tank. Um, I I'll, I'll leave it there because I don't know what for. Thank you. And Reverend Jide? Hi, everyone. I'm Jide McCauley. I am the founder and CEO of House of Rainbow. Um, House of Rainbow is an organization that supports Black, African, Caribbean, uh, LGBT people reconciling faith and sexuality. And I'm also a priest in the Church of England. So I serve in a local church in, um, in Leytonstone. Thank you. And I forgot to introduce my, myself. So my name's Gloria Dungo, and I am a prevention and testing coordinator um, at Positive East. So as I mentioned before, the, the theme for this year is um, mind, body and spirit. So could both of you tell me a bit about how you look after your body, mind and spirit and maybe what that means to you? Um, so it's, it's a bit challenging during this time, to be honest. Um, I think that I was thinking about this yesterday and, and there are times where you're trying to take care of your mind, body and spirit. And even though you're doing all the right things or the things that you usually do, that might not work out. But I think that's okay. I think um, I've been trying to exercise at home, which is, the, I, I, didn't do, I didn't bother in any other lockdown or when the gyms were closed, I refused. I'm trying to eat better, trying to go for walks in the park because um, you know it's important to get sunlight out to get some sunlight, uh, you know, um, meditating, uh, writing in my diary, that sort of thing. Um, I need to make more video calls with friends and family, I guess. Yeah, no, that's a good point you mentioned. Uh, probably like Phil, I mean, I've not done much about my body uh, recently. I mean, um, actually up to about early December, you know, I went out for walks quite regularly and I and, and, and I'd go for a light run as well. And I always prefer to do it at 6.30 in the morning when it's really quiet. And, and because I, I, I'm actually more of an early riser. But um, obviously in early December, I contracted the COVID uh, virus. So it really, really affected me. So it meant that I'm actually more tired um, in the morning. So what I'm trying to do now is to actually to reintroduce myself back to light exercise. So um, I'm picking up walking now. So I'll go out and have a walk for about 30 minutes to one hour, you know, just to get the fresh air and things like that. In terms of my mind, um, I do a lot of meditation and, um, and I also um, periodically I'll have a meditation coach that will support me throughout that period as well. And it's also very important because in the lockdown, even though you are alone you shouldn't actually feel the loneliness but try to communicate and well i do communicate with my friends a lot of video calls and phone calls as well and the other thing that i do every day is that you know not just because i'm a christian or a priest i mean i pray every day and you know and i also share on social media what i call every day is a gift it's just a one minute um presentation so people can find it on any of the platform of House of Rainbow, or if, if they follow me on social media, you will find, you know, the, the one minute meditation um, and prayer that I share. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you've both got some really good pointers there. Um, I think sometimes when we talk about like looking after ourselves, we forget that there's different aspects to that. So it's not all, only what you're surrounding yourself, it's also what you're putting into you. I think Phil made a good point about looking like at what he's eating and things like that as well. And there are links to like mental health and the diet you have and the way certain foods make you feel. Um, I find it hard during this bit, during lockdown, because you just want to sit at home and eat junk. So <laughs> it's about making that conscious decision and that effort to, to get out. And yeah, 
and to do something so even if it's a walk as you said or even if it's meditation it's really important to take care of that's what I mean Gloria the other thing again is that you know I mean I, I I enjoy cooking and I love cooking so um but obviously I mean once I cook one time you know I have it all stored away then I'll just take them out of my own leisure and and I think the important thing is to make sure that your food is also diversified so you've got your salad and your fruits and everything and um, I'm sure you know, we all have comfort food at some point. So I just, I mean, maybe limit that, you know, so, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, the next point is, so there was a study done in America and um, it looked at the intersection between black, being a black and um, being part of the LGBT plus community. And it found that being um, both black and being part of the LG LGBT plus community, um, people were often exposed to racism within the LGBT plus community. Um, so they're also exposed to homophobia, biphobia or transphobia um, as well within the black communities. Um, and sometimes uh, racism. Uh, how do you feel that this can, you know, this affects the general well-being of people who identify as both black and as part of the LGBT plus community? Um, it's, it's tricky. It's very tricky because I feel like being a black person in essentially a white world is difficult enough as it is. So then to add more something else that will then also make you with something about yourself that you can't change, which then makes you even more marginalized. It, it makes it even more difficult. And I think that the problem that we have is that um, it's primarily in online spaces or offline spaces of, like queer spaces where a lot of the time in the mainstream ones anyway, they can be traditionally very white and that can actually make you feel uncomfortable, let alone going to an event or going somewhere and then someone either, um, you know, fetishizing you or just be making kind of, I don't know, like microaggressions and all of that stuff. And it's just, it can be extremely difficult. It can be extremely difficult just naturally living your life as like, naturally living your life as a black queer person. I think that that has an effect on like uh, mind, body and spirit. Thank you, Phil. I mean, I think, I mean, black LGBT people are exposed to racism almost everywhere. Um, you know, for me personally, I have experienced racism within the uh, LGBT community. I have experienced uh, homophobia within the black community. So I am caught between the two. I am a gay man and I'm also a black man. So if the black community is not going to accept me as a gay man, do you understand me? It's actually going to take a miracle for the white community to accept me as a black man. So you can see the dichotomy of the problem that we're facing there. I think that, you know, again, we also need to look at the history. I mean, this study that you shared with us was done in the USA, you know, um, how about here in the UK? Last year, there was Black Lives Matter. And when the LGBT community joined the Black Lives Matter, there were people on the match that were telling us, this is not your match. This is not your place to campaign for queerness. And, but to be quite honest, I believe that when there are incidents like this, it actually changes, you know, the, 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 the narratives because queer people stood up. And thankfully, um, quite recently, uh, Voice newspaper, you know, is having these big breaking stories of black LGBT people. And I remember growing up with the Voice newspaper. I used to subscribe to the newspaper because it was the only newspaper that gives me stories about the black community. But, you know, the, the, the reality with both racism and homophobia is that it does impact on the mental health of black LGBT people. Um, religious homophobia is also part of that. And we need to be mindful, um, you know, of the consequences um, it's still difficult. I mean, I don't know what the answers are in, in all totality, but it's something that we need to work on. We need to work around the visibility. Um, you know, people like myself, people like Phil, you know, that are visible within the LGBT community is very important so that people know that we are human beings as well. Well, I also, like, kind of following from that, I also think that it's really important for 
um, people that claim to be allies to do more and to actually listen to us and uh, uplift us. I think that is also important in this. Thank you, thank you. No, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting when you're talking about um, the Black Lives Matter movement and how people weren't really inclusive of, um, of the LGBT community. And I think it's sort of the point that sprung up into my mind is when I was, uh, when I was reading about um, the SARS um, protests in Nigeria. And I know there were people from the LGBT community protesting as well. And I was reading threads on Twitter where people were arguing that, no, this is not, you know, we're derailing the movement. And I'm just thinking, why can't we discuss both? You know, why must it be one or the other? And if we're talking about people in Nigeria, is there no LG like you know what I mean you can't talk about an, an issue without including everybody we can't talk about black lives matter if we're not talking about all black lives it it it, it defeats the point to me and but I think that's that's really honestly Gloria I'm just going to make a quick point I mean I'm of Nigerian heritage so when all of this was happening there were courageous Nigerians queer Nigerians that were out there you know and um, the fact that people were told that no this is not your protest was pretty annoying. And to be quite honest, to some extent, there are people right here in the UK that also felt that the Black Lives Matter protest was not Black queer people's protest as well. Police brutality affects all of us on the grounds of our, the color of our skin, not even our sexuality. But in Nigeria, our sexuality, you know, um, LGBT people have faced far more police brutality just on the fact that they are gay. Some people are outwardly feminate or or masculine uh, women, and they, they get the wrath of the police and the community. So it needs to be addressed as an, an issue for everybody. And Phil, you, you nailed it. You said allies need to stand up as well. They do. Thank you. Thank you very much. And no, that was an interesting point. Um, so uh, the next question I had is, what do you feel like the challenge, challenges are um, in terms of accessing healthcare, um, and mental health facility care and spirituality um, when we're looking at people who identify as, you know, both a member of the black community and um, the LGBT plus community. Um, again, it's, it's, it's one of those things where the intersection, the intersection of our blackness and our queerness kind of, and I don't wanna say it's a disadvantage, but I feel like, you know, black people are like, you know, statistically affected by poor mental health and um, queer people are affected by, you know, poor mental health. So black queer people, like I'm not, my mental health is, you know, generally our mental health isn't great. And I think it comes from a lot of um, stereotypes of, um, you know, a lot of stereotypes of what you should be. And I think like living with kind of family expectations of how, you need to do you need to do and be everything that you know your family expects you to be and that these um, external sources like the aunties what they what they think of you is more unhappy, is more important than your happiness and i think all of that has an impact on our mental health before we're even able to understand that we even have mental health issues and then um, i think on top of that there's the the i guess the long standing history of i guess not so much now but I, I guess it still exists now, but not as badly as before, is that I think the kind of the misunderstanding of what mental health is or what mental illness is. And I think it's always been like, in, to, in, to my knowledge anyway, and especially around the, the 90s and early 2000s, it was always likened to like um, witchcraft or to, you know, things like that. And I think that also has an effect because then you don't understand that you have poor mental health. And it's only, it's I, I feel like, the way to kind of combat that is similar to what um, Jude said earlier is to have people of color that are queer to talk openly about their mental health and to, to talk about their journeys because I think that it's harder for black people to recognize that there's a problem because they've been taught that that, that isn't a thing that affects us. They've been taught that being gay is something that doesn't, it doesn't happen to us. It doesn't, it doesn't exist in our family. It doesn't exist in our culture, but if you go back like thousands of years, it, it always did. It was colonialism that kind of tried to erase that narrative. So I think it's, it's a very tough situation in general. And I think the, the, the way to combat it is to try to have more open and honest conversations about how you're feeling and, um, you know, I think um, especially when it comes to men and black men, there's such an expectation to be like this hyper-masculine or aggressive or this thug that kind of 
is input like kind of enforced on you from culture from society and like um from religion and i think it, it's just very tricky to unpick it's possible though mm. I, I'm, I'm actually just going to follow on uh phil i think when it comes to intersection of um being black and being lgbt i think that you know right now we represent that i represent that i'm a a black man, I'm a black African man, I'm a black African gay man, I'm a black African gay man who is a Christian, I'm a black African gay man who's a Christian who's also a priest, and of course who's also all of those things and HIV positive. So you can even see the intersection is growing. And I think that when we then begin to look at the challenges as regards to access to health care, you understand me, and you know, under the understanding or some understanding of spirituality, you know, some people have always said that if you're rich, you cannot be sick. And these are some of the messages or narratives that even comes out from the religious communities. Um, if you are religious enough, you cannot have mental health. Uh, uh, mental health sometimes is considered demonic. You understand me? In certain cultures, you know, I mean, the Nigerian culture that I grew up in, we don't, when I was a, a young person, even up to my age 30, I never went to a therapist or a counselor, seriously. And, and I knew if I, when I look back now, there are things that I needed to have, that the conversations I needed to have with counselors or therapists. I wish that was the case. I wish I had one, you understand me? But nonetheless, I think that when the, the challenges around mental health is also the fact that in, in, the, in the black community or in certain communities, they say it's demonic. And that presents a problem. Because if someone's saying that, have you gone to therapy for your mental health? They say, well, uh, it, it's demonic. And sometimes they even drive you to the church or drag you to the church. They want to cast out this spirit of mental health. Now, let alone your sexuality, which you know, often they've called an abomination. But I think that you know that there, 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 there is some way of finding a pathway towards some solutions, and I think it's really about changing the narrative. And you know, if we have mental health practitioners, you know, uh, within the Black community that can actually help, you know, by providing seminars and workshops to explain mental health in a way that is accessible and is sensitive to the cultures of Africans. Because to be quite honest, we can't erase it. I mean, we're talking on the platform of Positive East, and I'm sure in the history, you know, the times where condom was the one of the major HIV prevention, for example, getting Africans particularly to subscribe to that was very difficult, you know what I mean? But I think that we've evolved because we have other forms of HIV prevention beyond the condom itself. But the other point I also want to make is that, you know, Part of the impact and the challenge to all of this in the health care, mental health and spirituality is also connected to the British Empire, colonialism and missionary. And Phil, you, you started to talk about that. You see, the fact that, you know, you tell us that, you know, Jesus is white, you know, and black people are subservient and things like that has had an impact on how we think about certain things, especially in this culture. And, and you know, we, we have to begin to change the narrative so that it works well for the black LGBT people and the black community. It's not a one size fits all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, so I have one thing to say on that. Just going back to uh, colonialism, um, I'm, I'm from um, Sierra Leone and um, there's a law that was um, put there from England in the 1800s, which is still there to this day which basically stops some uh, stops queer men, especially from having any sort of rights or that can, uh, basically they can still get arrested or they can be killed or just for being themselves. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's, it's, it's a scary thing. I mean, I think um, Phil had made a really important point about, um, about um, queer people living or existing in Africa before like pre-colonialists and I hate this you know when people have this narrative of oh it's a it's a white thing you know um the the, the British people brought brought queerness over to Africa and it's like if you knew your history better you'd understand that it's not a new you know it's not something new it's something you know these are people that have existed in you know um 
when we're talking about mental health, um, I read a study somewhere where black men, I think it was like six or seven times more likely to be um, to access mental health services via police. Um, mm. So like when they've, they've got to the point of, you know, sort of near enough beyond help. Um, and it's a scary statistic because um, if people had earlier interventions or if they were, you know, if they were able to access healthcare and, you know, support earlier, it would prevent such issues. And I think it's why that's really important to have these discussions of, you you know, as you've both mentioned, um, to make sure that we, you know, we're, we're, we're challenging people's opinions. Um, and it's really important, I, I think, um, Jade, when you talk about you accessing therapy as somebody who's part of the church and showing people that it's not... You know, obviously you can you can have religion and you can believe in God and you can believe in Allah, but it's important also to make sure that you're speaking to a professional. Um, there was a website, I'm just getting up, up um, where you can, people can access um, Black, African and Asian uh, therapists and it's www.baatn.org.uk and you can find somebody um, from, from a person of colour, basically, if you'd like to, if somebody would like to speak to somebody um, from that background. Thank you so um, much. I, mean, I mean, before you go for, further, um, people also need to understand their history. And I think that we're, we're, we're also speaking, you know, relatively about LGBT History Month. Um, there has been LGBT people, you know, not just after colonialism, but before colonialism. And you know th there are stories historically about uh, King Nwanga II of Buganda, which is the current Uganda uh, country. Um, he was born in 1868, and um, you know we we know from history that he had relationship with men, and he was quite open about it. And I think that's one of the reasons that he was actually murdered to some extent. But I think that you know the, the reality is that LGBT people have always existed, and of course um, there is also Queen Unzinga um, in the Kingdom of Undogo, which is the current Angola country. And thankfully, Angola, you know, this year has you know a second um, um, publication about decriminalizing homosexuality in Angola. So I think for us it's very important that we are able to share with people that LGBT people do exist. And of course, even more recently uh, in Kenya, there is uh, Binyavanga Wanana, who unfortunately passed away in 2019. Um, popular writer, you know, he came out as gay and he used his platform as a writer, you know, to talk about his sexuality. And with the context of, um, of um, sexuality as well, Simon Nkoli, South African, um, you know, uh, HIV AIDS activists and also uh, a, a, a gay activist, gay rights activists. So there is, we cannot deny that LGBT people exist in Africa, but we can clearly say that there is, um, there is the, the, there is an importation of homophobia that has gone to punish our people and us, you know, and, and that's totally unacceptable. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, the next question is, um, do we, what do you think, do you believe domestic violence, um, homophobia, biophobia, uh, and transphobia violence um, and hate crimes in general affect the black LGBT plus community differently from the wider LGBT plus community? Yes, <laughs> definitely, because I think you also have to consider the fact that um, on top of um, transphobia, biphobia, homophobia, then we're like, we then also have, um, we have racism on top of that. We have racism, which then impacts those, those acts of violence. So I would definitely say that um, our experiences could be vastly different to, to, to people that are not um, black or that people are not people of color. I mean, I think, I think the lockdown has exposed the level of domestic violence um, within families, because if you're LGBT, um, you're a student or you're living at home with your family, it is just so ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I mean, the work of my organization went up about 150%, you know, from in the lockdown where people were calling us for, to support. Even just yesterday, receive another call um, you know, for support of domestic violence, where 
uh, a lesbian person was being you know, harassed in their own home by their own family. And, and it also includes religious homophobia. I need to emphasize that religious homophobia is a big problem for the LGBT community. Do you understand know I me? Mean? It's also the thing that they use for conversion therapy and you know, uh, deliverance healing. All of these things are totally unnecessary. So let's put it in context. Um, a lot of LGBT people experience physical violence on the grounds of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, emotional abuse is very high because if your parents are talking about the gay people are going to go to hell, uh, if any one of my children are gay, I'm going to disown them and you're under the same roof with them. That is domestic violence. Let's get, let's get that real. And of course, transphobia is also very key. We cannot ignore the fact that our, trans, um, uh, tra our transgender siblings suffer far more, you know, not well, actually they suffer more. Uh, let, me, yeah, let me own that, they, they suffer more, you know, violence because, you know, of the differences. And that to me is very, uh, is, is a serious problem. I think it's time that we also begin to look at the impact of suicide or the thought of suicide on, on the black LGBT people it is very real. And that is also part of the, the, the conversation around our mental health. You know, um, what, what, what are the studies uh, about thoughts of suicide? What are the triggers and, and the impact that can be upon us? Thank you, Jude. Um, so yeah, um, it's often believed that spirituality and um, being a person of color, you know, will come hand in hand. Um, do you believe that African churches or spiritual leaders have been able to create models um, where LGBT plus people can feel safe and accepted? Obviously, um, today we love the work that you do at House of Rainbow. Um, yeah, so um, how do you feel? Well, I mean, I, I think the first thing is that, to be quite honest, I mean, I, I wanted to say that the church is trying, but I don't think the church is trying enough. Um, but I mean, let me just start with the Church of England. Uh, for a number of years, the Church of England had this uh, project called Living in Love and Faith. And Living in Love and Faith was a, a module of uh, testimonials and teachings to begin to um, educate the wider church about LGBT people, okay? And the reality is that the rest of the church community is invited to embrace this um, project. You understand me? It's like, uh, it's like an educational training. So you, you, you follow the, the different training so that you learn a little bit more about LGBT people, their stories, their narratives, and so on and so forth. But there are still people within the church community that has gone against it, you know, so that they are given a narrative that is different, you know, to the realities of LGBT people. But of course, I mean, the Church of England as an institution hasn't even done a lot more. In 2019, I did a documentary on BBC called Too Gay for God. And in that documentary, I was clearly asking a question, what is it that I can be everything in the church, but I cannot marry my same sex partner in the church? You know, I can marry them in the registry, but I can't marry my partner in the church. That was quite problematic. So um, I, I think that the fact is that when it comes to the, 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 um, the, the relationship of LGBT people and the church and the spirituality, you know, there's a long way to go. But the good news for me and maybe for many people is that the organization that I work for, House of Rainbow, is a platform to support LGBT people on the journey of reconciling their faith and their sexuality. So we bring all of who we are together, plus prayer, plus education and support. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure that the wider church community are ready. I mean, I'm talking about the Church of England. I haven't even started to talk about the black majority churches where it is even much more um, abusive, uh, you know, towards the LGBT community. So there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Jude. Do you have anything to add, Phil? Um, no, I, when I saw this question, I was like, I'm just leaving this one to Jude. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree um, with Jude when it comes. I, mean, I, think, I think, let me just add a little bit more. I mean, it, it's not because Phil is not saying anything, but I think that, the, you know, 
the, the responsibility is not on the LGBT people to educate, you know, uh, people who are not LGBT people. It's exhausting. Every time I say I'm gay, then I have to explain myself. I've never had to explain to anyone who's heterosexual or ask them to explain uh, that, how they became heterosexual. You see what I mean? So if people want to learn more about gay people, especially, um, you know, definitions around LGBTIQ, thankfully, there's a library called Google Library. They can go and do their own research. And also, if they want to learn more about sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, and of course, the law, there's also Google. Honestly, it is too much of a burden on the LGBT people to have to explain every time. You know, I mean, it's LGBT history, man. And I was doing uh, conversations for one minute conversation on social media, you know, and coming out gay and my parents coming out gay, my siblings. It is exhausting. We're in day 20. I'm, I have to admit, I, it's going to be the grace of God that I go through the next eight days. But, but the reality is that if people want to learn more about gay people, they should invest some time in their own learning and then come back with that information to say, I now understand. And then we can have mm. a sensible conversation rather than, I mean, I'll tell you one thing that I don't do. If people go to my Facebook page or any of my social media platform and post hate messages towards me, and that's what we'll talk about in a minute. You know what? I do not reply them. What I do is that I delete that message where I screenshot it for the police. I delete it and I block them because it's exhausting for me to get engaged with them. I have better things to do with my time. Thank you, that was a good point. I think that you made a really good point about self-education. Like we're in 2021, Google is free. And I think sometimes people may ask out of curiosity, but there's a way A, to ask a question and B, as you said, Google is free. You don't necessarily need to come, you know, with some kind of ignorance. You can go and read up and then maybe come and have a discussion. And as you said, um, a serious discussion once they've read, because I think sometimes also being as a black person, when I'm talking about racism, I, I can't be bothered to keep explaining to people why black lives matter, the ex, you know, the race in our experience. It's exhausting. I'm, I'm, that's why I love that book. There's a book that said why I'm no longer talking <laughs> about, <laughs> about race. Cause it's just Absolutely. like, why, why must I keep explaining things? And I think growing up as a yeah, black that's person. That's the book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah. Thanks. So. <laughs> that's the book. Yeah, like growing up in 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 Essex in um the late nineties, early two thousand. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It got exhausting, even in school. Yeah. Like constantly explaining, you know, why this term is wrong, and mm. you know why you should. But it's just like, why am I teaching people to be decent human beings? Mm. You know, I mean, it, it. Some of the conversations don't even need to be had. Yeah. Um. Um, so yeah, yeah I'm, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump on this quickly because I, I recently reread this. I read it when I read it in 2018, and I read it like a few weeks ago. And like I got into a situation where there was someone that wanted to like um, basically discuss um, discuss my existence sort of thing. And then like when I just said I'm not having this conversation, they didn't know what to do. They don't know how to act. They're like, what? What do you mean? And it's like, well, I don't need to do this. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then when you, when you, I guess, take the power away from that, people don't know how to act. No, that's a good point. And it's a form of self-care. Mm. It's, it's a big form of self-care. I don't need to talk about this and I'm not going to. And as you said, people don't, like, I think people have this sense of entitlement. If I want to talk yep. about it, you have to, I don't have to discuss anything with you. If I make a point, I don't have to argue with you about my point either. It's my point. It is what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. you, can argue well, you, know, with you know, there's also the grace when people come forward to say, you know, I, I really want to learn, you know, can you help me? You know, even if they haven't gone to do all the research, like I said, but if they've come forward, you know, to say they want to learn and what should they focus on? I think that would be good. For example, we can signpost them to resources like the book that you showed up just now, you know, to say, there is something for you to read. Why don't you read it? And then we can have a conversation. Um, the one of the things that I always say to, to people is that 
especially sometimes if it involves religious leaders, you know, I said, when you look at the medical field, the doctors and nurses are always on a course. They're always renewing their credentials, okay? If there is a medical doctor in 2021 that haven't done any kind of additional training around coronavirus, I don't want to see them. I don't want to be in their surgery. So then what do we then not expect the same high standard of our religious leaders? Because religious leaders need to learn more about, the, about human sexuality. They need to, I mean, if you're confronted with something that is challenging to you, the last thing you want to do is to call it demonic spirit. Why don't you get your research cap on and go and do some studies? Mm. You understand me? Why don't you have a meeting, a conversation with the communities that are affected so that you can get to understand how best can you, you know, how, how can you navigate this new thing that has come into your, into your understanding? But when you, when you create a wall, then you don't want to learn. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a that's a really good point. Um, so the next question is: do, Are there any platforms um, within the Black community that you feel are really good for discussing um, achievements, struggles, just open dialogue, and you know, um, learning from each other? Um, is there any I don't know forums or groups you'd like to plug or say that are really good? Um, this is tricky because I feel like a lot of the time we have to create our own spaces. Mm -hmm. Similarly to how, um, you know, Jide created um, House of Rainbow because the, he, he noticed that that was missing. And I think that, I think now we're at a point where there's a lot of things there. And I, I also feel like because of the beauty of the internet and um, social media and podcasts, I feel like there's all sorts of places with this thing. It's hard to be very, very specific, but I think that particularly for young queer people, I think it's it's really important to get onto things like, um, you know, social media and just try to follow other, try and find people that are like you, try to find your community because I think a lot of us grew up with this belief that we were the only ones and that there was no one else like us and there was no one else before us and there'd be no one else after us. And for me personally, it was like finding people online, which made me understand that, you know, there are other people like me and around my age. I mean, I think we can further break it down also into interests as well, you know. Um, and, you know, earlier on I was saying that, look, I'm sick and tired of the first this, the first that, you know, um, the, the first African or the first Black person to achieve this or that. But I think that the reality in terms of platforms is that, yes, there are communities that are creating. There's, for example, Blackout UK. There is UK Black Pride. There is uh, Rainbow Noir in Manchester. There is Black B2 Health. There is House of Rainbow. There's a, you know, there's many. I think that maybe what would be useful is for us to maybe conceive uh, the idea of a directory, you know, so that we can have all of these organizations in one location so that people will know that these organizations exist for them. And, um, you know, so that, that would be an interesting project in itself. Um, to have a directory because I remember um, in, in it was November December um, LGBT Foundation um, in Manchester created a directory of organizations that support Black Asian minority ethnic people and I think that for me that was really important it was key you know that we are able you know to find a way to provide support. Um, you know, for the people, or at least signpost them to the support. Um, one of the things that we do at House of Rainbow is that we're creating a culture of collaborating. We want to collaborate with as many organizations so that we share platforms, you know, we can reach the audience, they can reach our audience, you know, we multiply the audience and people will know. And again, that's the power of logo as well. You know, when we put our logo on a project where we're collaborating, people say, okay, if House of Rainbow is endorsing this, then I will go for it, something like that. Thank you. Um, uh, Phil, would you like to tell us a bit more about the work that you do with PrepStar? Um, I know we had a little bit of a discussion before we started um, when we were talking a bit about PrEP and different communities, um, mm -hmm. lack of access to PrEP and things like that. Okay, so uh, first of all, PrEP is a drug that you take before and after sex that stops you from getting HIV. And um, I work for, um, within a project called PrepStar. And um, PrepStar, 
um, is now a part of a big organization called the Love Tank, which um, basically works to it works to to, to serve like un, typically underserved communities. So um, um, gay and bi men, uh, Black Africans, especially um, migrants, sex workers, trans men, women, and non-binary people. And um, we do a lot of work around um, sexual health and around kind of um, raising awareness of things like PrEP as well as um, HIV medication. And we have a whole heap of stuff on our website. And um, my work is primarily um, tar specifically targeted at queer men of color because um, we have higher rates of um, HIV and poor sexual health, as well as mental health whilst we're doing um, body, mind and spirit. And um, I guess um, a lot of the work that I do is around um, campaigns, trying to raise awareness, trying to um, reach people from this community and try to get information to them and also to their, pe their peers. So to get to pass that information on. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so last year, Stonewall UK published on their website a list of 10 ways to be a better ally to the Black LGBT um, community. How do you think we can all be better um, allies to Black LGBT plus people? You want to go first, Judy? I have my idea. Like, I'm ready. Into, I, well, I mean, to be quite honest, I, mean, I think the suggestion was very good. Um, but I think that it, it's not just the allyship because you have to be constant, you have to be persistent, and you have to be proactive. So it's not just getting the badge of honor one time. It has to become a lifestyle. You have to continue to challenge yourself and also to renew your own commitment to change. So um, non, I mean, like, let me give you a quick example. During Black Lives Matter, you know, when it all happened, for example, there were a lot of people that, a lot of white people that said, oh, Jude is my friend, but I can guarantee you that, you know, I don't think you can find my photograph in the album. I've never been to their home and things like that. But, you know, they, but the allies, you know, some in a different way, but they, you have to change that. I don't know, Phil, why you're laughing, but when it comes to- <laughs> You know exactly, you know exactly why I'm laughing. <laughs> But, but the reality, honestly, seriously, we it, let's be honest about it, right? You know, um, if you're going to be an ally to a community, you have to unlearn some of the bad habits, you know, that has created barriers on a serious note. Um, you know, and, and the same thing as well goes to the LGB community especially becoming good allies of transgender people. We need to drop our prejudices. We need to drop our misunderstanding and begin to learn more about how our behavior or our negative behavior impacts on the life of others. You know, very quickly, I mean, I, I grew up, I didn't understand bisexual people or transgender people because it wasn't part of my kind of growing up, I knew I'm gay and she's a lesbian, that's all I knew. But, you know, the other things I didn't understand, but thankfully that has all changed, you know. I am as knowledgeable, as, as passionate for everybody and not just LGBT people, anyone else that, that needs my attention would definitely get it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, to follow up that, um, all, you can all redeem, you redeem that. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it was good because I, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if you were going to say what I was going to say or not. But um, I think what is, what is really important is to listen. I think the, the problem that we have a lot of the time with allyship is that um, it's like, I want to do this and I want to do that and I'm going to do this. And it's like, sometimes you just need to shut up and listen. You need to listen to, to Black queer people, listen to our experiences, try to learn more. Try to listen to like the podcasts that we produce. Try to share the the you know the health campaigns that we do. Try to educate yourself first, and then use that information to educate other people. And I think a lot of the time with a lot of white people is that they don't know where to begin. So then they think, oh, this is too hard. So then I'm not I'm not going to do anything then. And then that doesn't help us get anywhere. Like even if you used to do something minuscule, it's still doing something. And I think. You can start off small, but I think it's so important to watch documentaries, to read books, to listen to podcasts, listen to the type of music that we like we create. Listen, like 
not don't become part of our culture, but try to understand our culture, try to understand our experiences, try to listen to our voices, and then use your privilege and your power to like raise us up. Thank you. No, you made you both made really good points. I think also as little thing as sort of tackling when you hear a, a comment that's ignorant or a comment that's incorrect challenge that person and maybe mm. next time they'll think twice before sharing that as well and then even within your own it doesn't have to be something grand even within your own houses within your own friendship groups within your own communities having these important discussions and sharing what you've learned so yeah you've both given really really important points we did have a question from facebook that i didn't see but somebody has asked how do how do you protect yourselves from getting exhausted from being a role model? I know you're all doing amazing work, but it can be tiring always being the people called on to speak. Are there many other people who are black and gay who you can call on to speak on platforms too? Well, I, I, to be quite honest, um, it does get exhausting. And how do you keep yourself, um, myself from getting tired? I'm very passionate about this. So number one, um, I could do this two, four, seven. But at the same time, you know, we're talking about self-care. Self-care matters um, because a lot of these things are also triggers as well. Um, yes, there are people. And uh, one of the things that we're doing at House of Rainbow is that, you know, we're staircasing, we're delegating. Um, you know, I don't do everything in my organization. It, it used to be just me for a long time. But, you know, now we're getting other people to step up, you know, to speak on behalf of the organization, on behalf of the community. And, and I think that that goes as well to other communities that I know of, you know, so that people can represent themselves and the organization. It's actually a good question. Um, I hope that the person that posted the question is still listening. Um, if you want to offer yourself as a volunteer to any of the organizations, <laughs> you know, seriously, it's true to speak, you know? It's true because you see the thing with L being, L being open as LGBT, it also comes with quote unquote consequences. You understand me? So if people want to learn more about, you know, speaking, or if you're courageous enough and you're visible, then let's do it. You know, let's do it. I mean, I I I, I don't want to monopolize this, but I think that the reality for me is that where do you find the black African openly gay HIV positive priest. So you need a lot of years to train before you get to that point. But it's not to say that I'm the only one. I think I'm just one of the ones that are visible. But speaking out is very important. We need more people. So please get in touch with us. We can make that happen. Thank you. And I just, I just really loved how Jude segued into getting a volunteer. Come I just thought that was beautiful. <laughs> That was like beautifully West African. Like I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, I, I have to um, kind of repeat what Jude was saying. And I think self-care is important. I think when I first got involved in HIV and sexual health, everyone was just like, even Jude at one point was like, you need to take care of yourself. <laughs> because I think it can be, because it's a, generally helping other people can be really taxing. It can be really taxing on yourself and I think that sometimes we we forget to take care of ourselves and if we, if we don't take care of ourselves then we're not going to be in a good enough position to take care of other people. Mm -hmm. um, as for um, in my field in, within um, HIV and in sexual health it's, it's very challenging. I think there's a total of four black queer men that I know that are out and proud like doing this work um, in a, like a front-facing kind of way. And I think there needs to be many more black women kind of in a similar position to me because I, first of all, don't want to do this all my life, even though I've only just started a few years back. But um, prior to me, it was mostly Mark Thompson, who um, I work with now, who was doing all of this work. And I feel like I'm kind of taking the baton from him and I, I, I'd be really happy to one day be able to pass this on to someone else for them to do this work. But I feel like there's so much stigma when it comes to HIV and sexual health. Like we're, we're all cool with talking about sex, but as soon as you wanna talk about getting tested or having like, and having an issue within sexual health, then it becomes like a barrier. And I think, I, I think we're becoming more open and honest about our health, about our mental health and eventually our sexual health. So I think we'll get there, but it's incredibly challenging. Hmm. 
No, definitely is. I think the issue is because for most of us, it's not a nine to five. It's not something that you can pick up and leave when you run. Because you're so passionate about the cause or about the work that you're doing, you find yourself carrying things with you everywhere. So it's like you've got a rucksack full of people's problems, your problems, things you want to do. How are you going to get there? Then you're thinking. So, yeah, I think it's really important as well to make sure that we look after ourselves mentally, physically, counseling I think fat counseling is fabulous even if you may not necessarily think that you have a maybe diagnosed mental health condition I think it's just great to check in with somebody as and when mm-hmm. you feel like you need support um so yeah no those are really really good points thank you very much so we're rounding up so here's the last question if either of you could have um dinner or sit down with an L- a black LGBT hero past present who would it be and why let me go first because I feel like <laughs> yeah, no, I, was I know today's like, answer. I'm not gonna ruin it for anyone. Oh, um, okay. Let me see. <laughs> if it was me, if I I would love to have met um James Baldwin. I think I would love to like sit down and have dinner and um, just uh, ask about his life and his experiences and like ask for advice and stuff like that. And especially ask about um stuff about writing because I I write as well. So that would be me. It's and sorry one so, sorry before we go into today so. Do you write? Is there any way we can access your writing? Is there any way have you got a blog or anything we can see? Um, it's kind of all over. I've been meaning to make a website for like a year. I haven't been able to. But if you, I mean, if you if you type my name, there's shit everywhere. <laughs> Sorry to swear. There's stuff everywhere. It's a family program. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I was gonna ask Phil. Who did you think my hero would be? Um, is it me? <laughs> Well, actually, you're one of them, definitely. I mean, I, I, I've already sat down with you, but I mean, I have too many. I'm so confused right now with that question. Um, but let me talk about Justin Fashionu. Um, J- Justin Fashionu, when Justin Fashionu came out as gay, I recognized myself in him totally. Mm. I mean, I think his birthday was yesterday. He would have been 60 years old yesterday. So he was five years older. He's still very young in the scheme of things. So, but when, because he's black, British, Nigerian, and gay, can you just imagine? So, and that's me too. I'm black, British, Nigerian, and gay, and Yoruba as well. So he's from, at least his, his heritage was also from my tribe in Nigeria. I mean, that is someone I would have loved to sit down with, um, you know, and just ask, about, I mean, because he, he did a lot of things through his coming out. I think at one point he wasn't, he, you know, he wasn't taking the homophobia anymore, but unfortunately, as the story went, you know, um, he, he took his life by suicide. So, and that made it really challenging. I, I, w- I want to ask deeply what was going on for him. I mean, I mean, he mm. has success as well because he was the first footballer ever in the world to have been, to earn a million pounds just by being a footballer, you know. So now they're all earning hundred million pounds but I think that you know I would have loved to sit down with him and and maybe ask questions about his of course I mean I later got to know about his family because his niece did a documentary but I would have loved to sit down with him and have those conversations those difficult conversations uh, about you know um, what was going on for him how was he handling uh, coming out being African Nigerian Christian family and so on and so forth Um, yeah yeah, but I mean, honestly, I have a, a hero in you, Phil, definitely. So I'm not going to take that away. Yeah. I knew it was coming. No, don't worry. <laughs> that is so nice to hear. Um, but no, yeah, definitely. I think the, I watched a documentary about John. Um, no, sorry, just Justin Fashanu. Um, and it um, it was on BBC Plan. I think it was by his niece. Yes, um, yes, um, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the thing about that documentary was that I, I think the niece must have been hurting that she had a gonku, as we say, we yeah, are gay for G for the uncle. She had a gonku that she probably didn't, you know, grow up with or who died. But I think that, you know, and also that documentary exposed her own father's, you know, doing, which was very painful. And of course, it also exposed the fact that even though Justin Fashionu came out as gay as a footballer, 
we need to like think how many footballers today have come at us gay, regardless of the progress that we've made in society, the progress that we've made in laws, how many, mm -hmm. especially, um, what's it called them, um, well, the big league, you know, um, football yeah, that have come at, yeah? What there's, you over 5, fo there's over 5,000 fo professional footballers. Um, I don't think any of them have come out whilst still playing. I think um, exactly. the majority of the time it's after yeah. they finish. Exactly. So, and, and I don't think that's helpful, especially for the young, um, you know, LGBT person that is maybe want to go into sports. I mean, the same thing with me as well. I didn't, even before I trained as a priest in the Church of England, I did not know any black gay priests in the Church of England. But I, I do know some of them are in the closet, but they're not open about it. That's the thing. Mm. They're not out about it. And I think to me, that's sending a wrong message to the rest of society, especially to wrong people that my life is not worth it. My life is a shame. And you know, my life is a denial and so on. That's the wrong message to send out to-, to it, It's difficult because not everyone, everyone's journey is different and, and you know, everyone, has different experiences. So it might be harder for other people to, I agree. I think it's important that there are a lot more people that are out and proud in the church, but I think because of the connection to religion, it makes it especially difficult. And then adding black, being black on top of that is, is even worse. You know, you know, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I, I don't want to stay in the place of difficult. And to be quite honest, I have paid the price, you know, for being open about my sexuality as a mm. black man in the church. Um, you know, the, the African community, if we're going to be honest, you know, do not really accept me. I mean, if they accept me, then we should be celebrating the fact that I am honest and open about my sexuality. And to me, it's not a big deal. I mean, I've had to go, I, with, within the Black community and the Black church, I've had to experience conversion therapy. I've had to experience healing and deliverance, you know, laying on of hands and trying to cast out the evil spirit of homosexuality, when indeed there was nothing wrong with me in the first place. Mm. Do you understand me? There's nothing to cast out because this is the way that I was made by God. So, I mean, for people to carry, to, to live the rest of their life with that degree of shame, you know, and, 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 and blame is ridiculous. Mm. And, you know, earlier on we're talking about mental health. This would trigger mental health because there will be gay men that will force themselves into relationship with women where they do not have business being in that relationship. Mm. So, and, and that to me is, is, is a challenge in itself. I mean, I'm not, I'm not taking away the fact that we've now reached a point in the world where we're talking about sexual fluidity, you know? So, I mean, I could wake up tomorrow morning and then I have a girlfriend and then I have a wife, you know, it's like, okay, as long as somebody's not saying that, oh, uh, he, he, he has found himself back, he's found his senses back. Because I know a lot of people have been able to navigate their sexuality, you know, between the spectrum. And if it works for you, fine. But don't demonize those who are same gender loving because it is still a valid sexual orientation. Yeah, thank you, Jude. Sorry to hear about your experiences, but I think you made some really good points. As a Christian myself, I'm a firm believer that God created everybody the, the way they are and God in the Bible when I read the Bible the, the big thing that jumps out to me is love it God loves everybody so you can't mm -hmm. you know be be saying that you identify as a Christian but you know you're preaching hate and dislike about certain parts of you know of, of our communities so yeah for me that's also fundamentally very very wrong Thank um, you so much. And, and this is what we're talking about eyelashes Listen, honestly, I mean, I know that we raise the subject, but it's not really, uh, uh, um, it's not the primary topic. But if anybody wants more information about the work that we do at House of Rainbow, please contact us. Um, you can contact us via our website. The website is under construction. So if you go there now, it looks like a mess, but you can always go to our social media platform on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Just look for House of Rainbow in all of those platforms and you know, it would direct you to us. And, um, you know, in a few months time, you know, we're going to be doing a webinar on what the Bible really says in favor of same-sex relationship. This is a place that people can learn. So I'm, I'm not getting into conversation with people individually that can come to the webinar. 
Thank you very much. Oh, did I just did I just promote something else? <laughs> that's a that's a good thing. I mean, you wouldn't be here if there wasn't some promotion. <laughs> we like that. We like that here. But um, yeah, if I was to meet two people, um, or if I was to meet one person, I'd love to meet Laverne Cox, just because I find her hilarious. Um, for those who don't know, Laverne Cox is an amazing uh, trans woman who has appeared on Orange is the New Black, and um, she does a lot of work um, with the, you know, the Black LGBT plus community community and um also i would love to speak i know this person's not black but i would love to speak to gareth um gareth thomas um for those who don't know he came out um as being gay and hiv positive i think it was in 2019 um so yeah when we were talking about justin i thought of him as well um but yeah Why do that, they have to be black though the, the i the, the question was about black people but they don't have to be black it's, it's just anybody that i think you can find interesting is there anybody else you'd like to add you can feel free to add someone else no i think i think that's that's my top person james Warden is my top oh. person. oh nice interesting um but yeah i think that's everything from us if there's anything else you'd like to plug before we say bye to everybody feel free if there's anything exciting you've got in the pipeline i know jude's mentioned the webinar um yeah. I mean, I did, just quickly, I mean, because um, um, the webinar is going to be sometime in April. We've not published the dates yet because we're still organizing things. I know that it sounds like we're, we're behind. But I think that what is important is that, you know, there is a platform to get a lot of information about, you know, um, reconciling faith and sexuality. Um, but I want to encourage people to follow us on social media, Instagram, House of Rainbow underscore, Twitter, House of Rainbow, and Facebook House of Rainbow. Thank you. And Phil? Um, could you follow us at Team Prepster on Twitter and Instagram or search Prepster on Facebook and visit our website for prepster.info for more information. Thank you very much. And yeah, as I mentioned, I'm Gloria Dongo and I work for Positive East. Um, we're still doing remote testing at the minute. So if anybody's interested in getting any, uh, in getting a HIV test or an STI test, they can uh, contact us at www.positiveeast.org.uk. Also, I do offer HIV awareness training. So you can also contact us um, via the website as well. So thank you both so, so much for joining us today. I've had a fabulous evening and it's been lovely chatting to both of you um so take care everyone and enjoy the rest of your evenings thanks for having us see you Bye. Bye.